Good evening. I'm Nick Ferrari and welcome to the LBC Leaders' Debate. In the next hour, history will be made, first and live on LBC Radio, where we're leading Britain's conversation every day. You've waited decades for this Leaders' Debate on Britain's future relationship with Europe, and here it is. Nick Clegg is Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the Liberal Democrats and says his is the party of in. Nigel Farage is the leader of the UK Independence Party and is equally unequivocal. He wants out. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage. <laughs> the rules. The rules are as straightforward as the, the, the debate. After a brief opening statement, each will face a series of questions from a carefully selected and evenly balanced audience. Neither has the slightest clue of the questions coming their way. Now, to decide who goes first, what better way than to flip a coin, a good old English pound? <laughs> Deputy yeah. Prime Minister, as you threw down the challenge and you are higher in the alphabet, I'm hoping I catch it. I'd ask you to call it, please. Heads. So the Deputy Prime Minister says heads, and as we can see, it has gone to tails. Nigel Farage, you have the choice. You can either go first or second for your first minute. No, I will ask Nick to open the batting. Nick, Nick Clegg to open the batting. Your minute starts now. This debate is about you. And it's really simple, because it's about your job. Or if not your job, the job of someone else that you know. And it's about making sure that the sacrifices that you have made to fix our economy aren't wasted. Because, make no mistake, if we cut ourselves off from Europe, from the countries that we trade with more than anyone else, then our hard-won economic recovery will simply be thrown away. It's also about who we are. A Britain that leads in the world by standing tall in our own European backyard. A Britain prepared to work with other countries on the things we can't possibly sort out on our own. So don't let UKIP or anyone else put all of that at risk. We're better off in Europe, richer, stronger, safer. And that's why I will fight to keep us in, for the sake of jobs, for the sake of our clout in the world, for the sake of Britain. Mr Clegg, thank you. Appreciation for Mr Clegg. If you would, thank you. <laughs> Nigel. Thank you very much. Nigel Farage, your minute starts now. Well, we're having this debate. At last, it's taken a very long time. Just imagine, though, we weren't debating whether we should stay or leave. Just imagine we were debating whether we should join the European Union. And I put it to you that what we ought to do is vote yes in a referendum to join a club that will cost us £55 million a day as a membership fee, uh, that will give us thousands of new laws over which our own parliament and you, the electorate, uh, can make no difference. It'll mean an open border unconditionally to 485 million people from across the whole of Europe, many of them from very poor countries, and they can come here and work and live and settle and bring their families and do as they wish. Uh, and it would also mean that we would have to cut our links with other parts of the world, the Commonwealth, the Anglosphere, and many other parts of the world, because we'd lose the ability to make our own trade deals. I know the result of that referendum, you wouldn't join it. The debate here today is between a tired status quo defending a crumbling European Union that frankly isn't working anymore and a fresh approach which says let's be friendly with Europe, let's trade with Europe but not be governed by their institutions. And your appreciation for Mr Farage, please. <laughs> so, we move to the first question so that you understand, again, each of the leaders gets a minute approximately to respond. I choose who goes first. And then we debated between us. So let's find, please, Deborah Tioradini. Deborah, where are you and your question, if you would? I'm here. Go ahead. Why won't politicians trust the British public by giving us a referendum on our membership of the EU now? And let's turn to Nigel Farage. Because uh, they're worried about the result. They think you might vote differently to their view. And, you know, Nick is here, and I'm very pleased that Nick laid down the gauntlet for this debate, but Nick is not here just representing the Liberal Democrats. He wants to say a member of the European Union, but of course that's David Cameron's position and it's Ed Miliband's position. And what happens is, from time to time, they offer us a referendum. You know, they do it cynically, funny enough, at election time. 
Uh, and they say, vote for us, we'll give you a referendum, and then do their absolute best not to. Five years ago, Mr Cameron was offering us a cast-iron guarantee of a referendum. Uh, Nick Clegg himself, you know, in the last European elections and general elections, said it's time for a real debate, let's have a referendum. Well, Nick, we're having this debate, and it's a good thing that we are, but I agree uh, with Deborah's sentiment. Why don't we trust the British people to make their minds up on what I think is the most important constitutional question we faced in this country for 300 years. Are we to be a self-governing nation or not? And I agree with you, I would like this referendum to take place before the next general election. And let's turn to Nick Clegg. I also agree with you, uh, Deborah, that when, your, when powers which rightly belong to you and to the British people are passed to the European Union, it's happened many times in the past with the, the rule changes that come along from time to time, the way that the rules are rewritten within the European Union, that should never again happen over the heads of the British people. Then the, British pe the consent of the British people should be asked by way of a referendum. That's what I've always believed. That's always been my position. I've never wavered in that position. That's why the last time the rules changed, something called the Lisbon Treaty, I said there should be a referendum. I've gone further than that, actually, now in government. We've actually legislated. It's the first time anyone's ever done that. We've passed into law a legal guarantee for you, Deborah, the next time. You're asked to give up powers to, to, to Europe. The next time the rules change, the next time something else is asked of the United Kingdom within Europe, it's not going to be the decision of Parliament or politicians or the government of the day. It's going to be your decision in a referendum. But, Nick, the rules change every week. Every single European directive, every single new regulation, every single court judgment, frankly, that comes out of, out of Luxembourg, every single time a new EU law, law is passed, yet another small chunk, albeit small, and it's incremental, yet another small chunk of our ability to govern our country goes to the institutions of Brussels. And I think the real frustration is that all of you keep using this form of words when there's the next significant change. In the space of this coalition government, we've transferred control of the City of London, we've allowed the EU's foreign policy to become bigger and stronger. And surely, what the lady's really saying is, why don't you trust her? Because they've actually given up believing anything that you say. And, and if, you say, if you say, the next time there's a big change, there'll be a referendum, and, and Mr Cameron says it, and Mr Miliband says it, no one believes you're actually going to deliver. And maybe that's the role of UKIP. Well, maybe. Let's the reason we're having this debate is that UKIP are forcing you onto that turf. No, let no I, 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 I accept, and that's why I said to Deborah, we've done something which no government has ever done before, which is you need that guarantee, not just you know, from what different party leaders or politicians say, but you need that in law. Now, you've got that guarantee in law. That's never happened before. And I think, you know, I think Nigel says, let's have a referendum next Tuesday, next Wednesday, next Thursday, every time there's a sort of, you know, a decision taken somewhere else in the European Union. It's really important to remember, this is a decision which would, which would have a huge effect, which would have massive consequences on our country for, for generations to come, for decades to come. So the idea that you do that it, sort of flippantly, I think you do it when new powers are being, if you like, asked of the United Kingdom, and those new powers are going to be transferred to the, to the European Union. That's my view. I think if you were to do it now, given how the European Union is in, a, is in a real state of change and flux at the moment, you've seen all these problems in the Eurozone, they're sort of changing their arrangements. I don't think we really know what we're having a referendum on. So yes, let's have a referendum. Let's have that legally guaranteed in law at the time when new things are asked of the United Kingdom. Mr Clegg, I wonder if I can read you the words from a very prominent politician back in 2008. It's time to give the British people a real referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union. And there we are, there's a very fresh-faced, <laughs> carefree politician there in that poster. Mm. Why are we still waiting? Well, if, if everyone could read the small print, which I suspect you can't, what it said... No, 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 uh, I don't mean the small print, I mean in the leaflet. What it said was, at the time we were debating a new change in the rules, which is exactly what I was just referring to with Deborah, at the time in 2008, there was a new treaty, the Lisbon Treaty. This is the treaty where, as uh, Nigel Farage rightly uh, points out, the Conservative Party changed radically their attitude towards it. I, was I had exactly the same view in 2008, 2009, 2010, namely, when the rules change, when new things are asked of you, powers which rightly belong to you, then it is your decision in a referendum. That's why... I said in that leaflet, and indeed in countless debates like this, that's when the referendum should take place, and now we've gone further. We've guaranteed that right to have that referendum in law. But the trouble is you're defining transfer of powers in terms of treaties. 
there is a possibility that actually there won't be any treaty change. Because in fact, what's happened since, the, since your beloved euro um, has gone into a tailspin is without using treaties, they've managed with the eurozone countries to acquire yet more power at the centre. Sure. And surely, you know, there is a very urgent need to have this. This isn't flippant. No, no, I, and, I accept, all, I accept. and everybody in this room, over the age of 55, mm. and I bet there are many in this room mm. who voted as my parents did, yes, but they voted yes to a common market. Mm. So frankly, this is unfinished business for the mm. over 55s, no, I, and there are 35 million of us who've never been given the chance no, to have I, a look, say. I, I accept that if you think there should be a referendum, you know, come whatever, you want a referendum next Wednesday, my position, of course, is not, is not for you. If you think there should never be a referendum, there are some people who don't think we should have a referendum, then my position is not for you. If you believe, and I think many people believe, that you have referenda in our country, in our parliamentary democracy, when there's an important question to answer, when new powers are being transferred from our country to the European Union, that's when. That's when it shouldn't be done in Parliament, shouldn't be done by any government, it should be done by you in a referendum, and I, and the government of which I am part, has guaranteed that in law for the first time ever. Let's get to... Indeed, if you hear something you like, that's what you do. Nigel Farage, um, you have paid tribute to the fact that Nick Clegg is prepared to debate you. Yes. What does it say about the courage of the other two party leaders they're not here? Uh, well, Mr Cameron said he was too busy running the country. Well, he's certainly busy running from something, isn't he? Um, and Mr Miliband did his best not to give any response at all. I think, I mean, the one thing I will say is that UKIP are certainly united on the European question, and the Lib Dems are very strongly united on the EU question. Uh, the Tory party have a sort of historic fault line, uh, which is very visible to all. You've got something like 80 backbenchers who now rebel regularly um, on the European question, whether it's, remember, two years ago, they were being three-line whipped not to give us a referendum. So, so there's a big rebellion there. But I think actually, uh, within the Labour movement, uh, things are not quite as serene as they may appear on the outside. And I think also the Labour Party has a big split. So they'd rather not talk about it, and they'd rather but, conduct the European elections not even discussing this question. But by taking the stance you have briefly, Nigel Farage, yeah. are you destroying UKIP's best chance of a referendum? Uh, no, I think one of the things that will happen um, over the course of these European elections and perhaps beyond is that commentators in this country will wake up to what is currently the greatest myth in British politics. The myth is that UKIP take Tory votes, therefore we'll damage the Tory party, and that'll lead to a Miliband government. The truth of it is, only one in three UKIP voters is a former Conservative. We pick up the bulk of our votes from old Labour and from non-voters right. getting back into politics. Nigel Farage, thank you. Let's move to our next question. John Connolly. Mr Connolly, you're a builder, and I think your question pertains to that, sir. Yeah, um, you talk about economic recovery and jobs. Our borders are wide open to hundreds of thousands of Eastern Europeans coming and taking low-paid work. Now, it's a brilliant thing that the tax threshold has been risen to £10,500 for people in low-paid work. All right, so thank you. Just to repeat, uh, what Mr Connolly is saying is there are hundreds of thousands of Eastern Europeans coming here. They take low-paid jobs. The tax threshold is not enough. Where is the benefit? Uh, we must start with you first, uh, uh, Mr Clegg. Clearly, uh, the point that uh, you're referring to, John, is incredibly important. And it's a very emotive issue, this, about people coming in and out of our, in and out of our country. And indeed, of course, many Brits, about two million, uh, one and a half million Brits who live uh, elsewhere in the European Union. And we've got to get the rules right. That's why the government, uh, this government, has significantly tightened up the rules. That's why, for instance, I want to uh, restore exit checks at our border so we count people out as well, as well as we count them in. People can't just come here to claim benefits, for instance. Yes, come if you want to try and work, come if you're, if you're really going to make a contribution, if you're going to play by the rules, but you can't simply receive benefits, no questions asked the first day. That's why we've changed the rules. But let's remember, of all the new jobs created over the last year or two, nine out of ten of those new jobs have gone to British workers. Let's remember that actually people who come to our country, they create wealth, they pay taxes, they help sustain our NHS. If we were simply to pull up our drawbridge, we would, we would destroy jobs for everybody in this country. And that is not something I'm prepared to see happen. All right, we'll come, come to you in a second. Thank you. Nigel Farage. Oh, I love it. Nick says he wants to get the rules right. Let me tell you what the rules are, Nick. The rules are we're members of a European Union which has total free movement of goods, capital, services and people. And that may have been OK when we were in with countries, you know, like the Netherlands and France and Germany with roughly similar living standards and hospitals and primary schools. What we've done is we've let in uh, countries that were trapped behind the Iron Curtain for years, uh, Romania, for example, where the minimum wage is a ninth 
of what it is in this country. And we have a total open door, unconditionally, no. to 485 no, million people, and they are the rules of the European no, Union, and you cannot be allowed to get away with saying you want to get the rules right by putting in these weasel words about benefits. Yeah. This gentleman who's asked the question, John, he's not talking about benefits. Yeah. He's talking about the fact yes. that for hundreds of thousands, thousands of people working in trades like the building industry, Five seconds, Mr. we've had a massive oversupply of labour and you've seen your wages go down over the last 10 years as the cost of living has gone up. And that is not fair okay. on working people Mr. in this country. Mr. I, Mr. I, Craig, I, actively shaking his head. Mr. I, Craig. I understand, I understand, John, as I say, this is, a, this is an issue which um, creates great anxiety. Uh, people are, are, are unsettled by the whole immigration. I, I understand that. Um, but we have to have this debate on the basis of facts. And what you've just heard from Nigel Farage is simply not true. I've got here a leaflet from what Nigel the, Farage. Can I, can, I just, can I just finish the point? This is a leaflet that, yep. that Nigel Farage's party distributed in the recent Eastleigh by-election. You may remember it. It says here that 29 million Romanians and Bulgarians may come to this country. There aren't even 29 million Romanians and Bulgaria, Bulgarians living in Romania and Bulgaria. Ah. It is simply ah. not true. So, so, you know, let's, let's have this debate, John, but let's have it based on fact. Let me give you one more fact. One out of seven of every company, new company, created in this country are created by people who come here, pay their taxes, play by the rules. If we pulled up the drawbridge overnight, as Nigel Farage implies, our NHS would collapse overnight. Yes, let's make sure that we bear down on unscrupulous employers who, for instance, don't pay the minimum wage. That's why this government has quadrupled the penalties we're going to impose upon unscrupulous employers. Let's bear down on the loopholes. Let's make sure people do play by the rules. But let's not scare people by, by claiming things that are not true, which would have the consequence right. of making us poorer and putting more people out of work. Yeah, that did, surely cannot be right. You didn't answer the question, did you? You didn't answer the question. You try to do trickery with the 29 million, saying there aren't 29. You know why? Because 2 million have left already. And they've gone, <laughs> and they've gone to Italy and to Spain. Nick, you didn't answer the basic question. I'm not claiming 29 million people have the right to come to Britain. Yes, you do. I'm claiming 485 million people have the total unconditional right to come to this country if they want to. And I think you're quite right. You're quite right. The fact is, so let me have a... if we're members of the European Union, we have the complete free flow of people. Are you denying that? Yes, it is not unqualified. You, you are it is, it that. is not the case that anyone can move to this country and simply claim benefits, simply didn't live mention here. benefits. Let me, let me, let I me, didn't mention benefits. You let keep me, doing benefits. No, We're me, talking about the free movement of people and the ability could I, could I just in make, jobs in could industry I just make, to get a job. Let's let the deputy prime minister speak. Once again, I think what you what you owe, what you're owed, are the facts. Not simply a lot of, you know, opinion. You're, you're owed the facts. No since, here, since, fact. two th since 2004, about two million people from elsewhere in the European Union have come to our country. About half of them have returned. At the same time, there are one and a half million Brits who live elsewhere in the European Union. So, really the question is, just, let, I think Nigel Farage needs to provide you with an answer. If we do pull the drawbridge up, we simply say, no one else allowed. Put up that sign at the cliffs of Dover. What happens to the one and a half million Brits who are elsewhere? What happens to the businesses? What happens to the British jobs that are dependent on people coming to this country? And don't just believe me. Listen to the people who employ thousands upon thousands of British citizens in this country who say that if we turn into a closed country rather than an open one, we will be poorer and we will have higher unemployment. And I'm not prepared to see anyone lose their job on the altar of Nigel Farage's anti-European dogma. All right, gentlemen, just pause for a moment. Thank you. This is the LBC Leaders Debate, Nick Clegg versus Nigel Farage on the European Union. You're listening on LBC, watching on lbc.co.uk. Take part in the reaction using the hashtag hash LBC debate. And the LBC listeners have been e mailing in their questions. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, perhaps I could put this to you from LBC listener Carol Lauderdale. Is it right to have child benefit paid for children not even living in this country? No, I think that's exactly one of the things that uh, don't make any sense and one of the many reasons why 
uh, the government, of which I'm Deputy Prime Minister, why we've changed the rules. So, for instance, uh, no one could just turn up here and claim benefits, no strings attached, no questions asked. We're the first government ever to make sure that you've got to wait at least three months before you claim uh, any benefits, that if, you are, if you've been here for six months from elsewhere in the European Union and you haven't found a job, you can't receive uh, job, uh, job seekers' allowance. Housing benefit is no longer going to be provided to people from elsewhere in the European Union. If people come here from elsewhere in the European Union, they can't uh, support themselves. But you've been They're not looking for the work. They're not looking claim. for work. If they, are, if they are out on the streets, begging on our streets, and they shouldn't be here, we send them back home. So there are limits, and there are things we can do, but where Nigel Farage and I disagree is that I think that if we simply pull up the drawbridge and refuse to allow people to come here, play by the rule, pay their taxes, create jobs, it'll be bad for Britain. Never mind anyone else, it'll be bad well, for I, our it, country it, it's itself. It's all well and good saying it'd be bad for Britain and pulling up drawbridges. What you're not doing with this question, as you did with the previous one, is actually to answer it. Because the truth of it is, if you come into this country and take a job, let's say on minimum wage, you qualify on day one for a full range of in-work benefits, including child benefit for your kids living back in Bucharest, how many, how many, uh, back in Bucharest, how many people or whatever from, it is. Can well, I ask a question? Can I ask yes, a question? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Clare. Uh, Nigel Farage, how many people from elsewhere in the European Union, in terms of the total number of benefits claimed, do you think, what is the proportion of the benefits claimed by people from elsewhere in the European Union? Do, tell, tell me what At the, the moment, there. mercifully small. Well, how, how, small? Are, how small? Well, I'll tell you. There are only 45,000 children living let, in parts of Eastern Europe that are currently claiming let child benefits. Let me give benefit. the answer. But, I would, give answer, answer, but I would answer that's 45,000 too many. Uh, and Surely the benefits system is for citizens of this country sure. and let's hear the who've worked and paid in for the years. The answer, the answer, the answer, Mr. Clay. The, the, the answer is, in terms of all benefits claimed, the benefits claimed by people from elsewhere in Europe is 2% of the total. Now, Nigel Farage says 2% is too much. That's it is 2%. Benefits. In other words, it is a very, very small proportion of the total. Again, the facts show that people who come here from elsewhere in the European Union to work and pay their taxes pay much more into our coffers than they take out in benefits. Right. In fact, if you look at the, last, at the 10 years from 2001 to 2011, they contributed close to £22 billion. Pounds. That right. helps fund our schools, helps look, fund our look, hospitals, I'm helps sorry. fund our we, we police, helps fund I'm sorry, military. Nick. I'm sorry, so we Nick, must I can't... make our country poorer I'm sorry, because Nick. of the, the, the determination Mr. by UKIP and others to, to turn our I'm back sorry, on the rest Nick. of the I'm world. I'm sorry, Nick. A, a sentence, that, if you would, Mr. What Farage. that study did was to say who's in work and what tax are they paying. What it did not do was price in the in-work benefits, which okay. is housing benefit, child benefit, We've tax housing. credits, right. and child tax yeah. credits. And the point is, actually, there's a, there's a study by Migration Watch that says from 95 to 2011, in total, immigration into Britain cost us 140 billion sterling. All right, Let, let's move on to another question. Thank you for that. Uh, Varsha Nusimlu, who's a marketing executive. Varsha. Uh, my question is, if the free movement of uh, EU citizens was restricted, would this create any skill shortages in the UK? And it's Nigel Farage's turn for the first minute. Mr Farage? No, because I believe what we ought to be doing is operating a system of work permits. Work permits in, in, in terms of what are the shortages that we may have and what are the skills that other people may want to bring to us. But I think it's complete madness to say we have a total open door to nearly half a billion people, and any of them can come. Not only do we not have quantity control, we don't actually have any quality control either. So what we're now doing is we're saying to people from India, and we say to people from, from New Zealand, who've got skills to bring to this country that we want, no, you can't come, because we have to leave room for the now 4,000 people a week that are coming to settle in this country from southern and eastern Europe. And that, that strikes me as being a crazy immigration policy. Let's, let's actually not think of it purely in European terms. Let's think of it globally. Let's be happy to give people work permits, which gives them the right to come and work in this country. They must bring some insurance to cover their health affairs. And if after a period of time they've been here, Five and they seconds. haven't committed any crimes, and they want to become citizens of this country, then they'd be good, acceptable people to have. And at the moment, we're okay. not choosing on the basis of quality. Mr Farage, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Clegg. Basha, my, my, uh, my view on this is that, of course, we should always do more to improve skills. That's why I'm incredibly proud of the fact that over the last four years we've expanded apprenticeships, for instance, for, for young British people, to give them the skills to, to find work on a scale that you know, we haven't seen in a generation or two. Of course, we should prioritise giving skills training uh, to, to, to British youngsters. But the idea that we help them then find jobs by pulling 
the, draw, the, the, the drawbridge up, simply turning our backs on you, simply doesn't make it. I'll give you an example. <coughs> Just yesterday, a German company, which a household company, uh, Siemens, announced they're going to create 1,000 jobs in Hull, in the Humber area, in a new offshore wind uh, centre. A thousand jobs for people in actually a part of the country that's desperately crying out for extra jobs. Guess what the chief executive of that company said? If we were not within the European Union, Siemens would make it quite difficult for me to continue to invest in UK factories. There you have it. They wouldn't create the jobs for which the skills are necessary. That is why I don't understand in pursuing the withdrawal from the European Union, we would make our country poorer if we did what UKIP said. Well, the jobs would go. Nigel well, Farage. I mean, they would go. I mean, the foreign, jobs would go. Foreign direct investment is an important point. It is a key point. And I, I so well remember, uh, Nick, you um, and all your gang, all the big corporates, um, all telling us 12 years ago that if we didn't join the euro, remember that? If we didn't join the euro, all investment into Britain would cease, the city of London would disappear. And all I can say is thank God we didn't listen to you. Um, otherwise, we'd have been in one hell of a mess. And, and, and despite the fact, despite the fact we ignored you then, uh, foreign direct investment is coming into the United Kingdom um, at a greater level than it is to all the rest of the countries of the European Union combined. And fascinatingly, when Ernst & Young did a survey in North America and in Asia where the big investments are coming from, two-thirds of both of those investors said actually if the UK was outside the European Union and we didn't have the expensive regulatory regime, they may well invest even more money. But I, look, I, I personally will, and I suggest many people would probably feel in the same position, you're going to listen to what investors actually say about the decisions that they make about investing in our country than politicians like Nigel Farage or myself. Just the other day, I was up in Sunderland. Nissan, a major, major employer, they employ over 7,000 people in the Northeast. They export 80% of the cars they produce in Sunderland to elsewhere in Europe. They couldn't, could not have been clearer. If we did what UKIP did, they wouldn't invest in Sunderland. There wouldn't be those 7,000 jobs. If you don't believe Nissan, if you don't believe Siemens, listen to what the chief executive of Ford in Europe said. Briefly. He said, don't discuss leaving a trading partner where 50% of your exports go. That would be devastating but for the UK economy. Mr. Craig, I believe I, I, what they say, that they would not invest in this country if we were not part of what is the world's largest economy. Mr. Craig, Why would we pull ourselves out of the world's largest economy Craig, when 50% of our you. exports go to the rest of Europe? You mentioned Ford. You mentioned Ford. You are aware that they closed a plant in Southampton last yeah. year so they could move the work to Turkey. How does that square? Yeah. Well, of course, of course, companies move operations from one country to the other, but they will exit from the United Kingdom, leaving thousands and thousands of families <coughs> distressed in their wake because they will not have a breadwinner in those families, able to pay their bills, able to, to look after their families because the investment has gone, the jobs have gone, and that's the, what they're all saying. Just okay. just last week, just last week, Very we had an announcement. We had an like announcement that. from Hitachi, right. a big household okay. name again, and they said yeah. they're going to make our country the global hub, the global headquarters of their rail business. And they we, said they're doing that we because we're part of the European okay. Union. Mr. Clay, we, we must, let's get Nigel Farage I, I back into really this. I want to give you an e You're going to respond, well, Nigel well, Farage. This I, is for let you. me answer the Ford question, if I can. Very Nick, quickly, if you uh, would, Because Farage. actually that happened with money given to Ford by the European Investment Bank, including such that we actually ourselves as taxpayers subsidised Ford to close down in <laughs> Southampton and with European money move to Poland. And this car market debate, we sell a million cars a year, Nick, to the European Union. All right? It's an important marketplace for it. Declining, of course, because they're in e real economic trouble. But they sell us 1.8 million cars a year and cars of much higher quality and price. The point about trade is the German car industry needs the British market far more than British manufactured no, no, cars no. need right. the European Mr. market. Mr. Farage, and that's called the world of business. Mr. Farage, that respond. is how it works. Mr. Yes. Farage, respond to this... Uh, yes. This email from LBC listener Max Lake. If we came out of the EU, this would affect the job prospects of young people. He's right, isn't it? I think he young is right. people watching. No, I think he is. I think Max is right because, ah. because outside the European Union, we would be able to get rid of some of the ridiculous excesses that we currently have. You see, it's all but well and good. Want to work it's all in well Spain. and good. It's all well and good to have employment legislation that is designed for giant multinational companies. Uh, but if that legislation applies to small firms, and bear in mind 60% of people that work in the private sector in Britain work for companies with 10 employees or less. I spoke to a business yesterday that was about to set up 
They approached the Forum for Private Business to ask for advice on employment law. They were sent a document that is 350 pages long. If we could reduce that burden of employment, health and safety and work, and environmental law, we could create... How many, how many, we could create how many jobs? Many, how many, many, how many jobs, jobs indeed. And, and, and that is really a major problem okay. that okay. the British economy currently has. Well, thank you. Nick I, think, I, think the answer, I think the answer that uh, UKIP and other people who want to withdraw ourselves from what is the world's largest economy need to answer is how many jobs are they prepared to sacrifice? It's been reliably estimated that over three million jobs are linked to our position within the European Union, which is, by the way, a marketplace of 500 million shoppers, 500 million consumers who buy our goods and services that we sell to them. And unlike what you just heard, 50%, half of what we sell goes to the rest of Europe. Actually, the rest of Europe, only 8% of what they sell goes to us. So we benefit en enormously from this. Now, if it's not 3 million, because I guess 3 million jobs, of course, <coughs> wouldn't disappear overnight. Is it 2 million? Is it 1 million? Is it 500,000? My view is we shouldn't be sacrificing a single job a single job just to fulfil this dogmatic view that we should turn our backs on the rest of the world and on, on Europe. It, three million jobs is three million pay packets, is millions of families in this country really being able to pay their bills well. which they otherwise wouldn't. We really and that's why this is at the end of the day I, we, about jobs, jobs, you know, jobs. I, 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 I have to say, there is, you know, when there you ask Nigel Farage, one moment, there is some research that will question that three million figure, I have to say, Deputy it, Prime Minister, Nigel Farage. Uh, Nick, you know, when you answer a question uh, like that, uh, by saying three million jobs are at risk. Uh, you show uh, that, like virtually everybody at Westminster, uh, you've never run your own company, you've never had a pro proper job in the real world, you are part of this political bubble uh, that picked up a piece of research that was produced ten years ago by a guy who himself now says all he said was the jobs are linked to trade in Europe, they're not at risk. What I said. And all of you, all of you, you all do it, Tories do it, Labour do it, uh, the big banks do it, the multinationals do it, uh, and the truth is this, we sell, in terms of manufactured products, about £100 billion of the goods every year to Europe. It's about 40% of our overseas sales. It is quite important. No, 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 no doubt it's important. Declining every year, but important. But the point is this. They sell us roughly £150 billion of the goods every single year. The United Kingdom, this is extraordinary, the United Kingdom is now the Eurozone's biggest export market in the world. They sell us more than they sell to Japan, or to China, or to the United States mm. of America. And trade is not something created by politicians and bureaucrats. No. Trade is created by consumers who make a decision. I like this, pro this product, right. I'm prepared to pay its price. I spent 20 years in the private sector. I can tell you something, in private business, the customer is king. And when right. it comes to renegotiating a trade agreement with Europe, with no threat to any jobs, apart, of course, from the commissioners um, and the British MEPs, it'll all be turfed out on their ear, and that's no bad thing. Uh, when it comes to a renegotiation of that deal, we actually hold the whip hand. I, I, this is, that this, is the real is, world of economics. Let, that let, is how bring, it works. Gentlemen, this, let's this, bring in another... Mr Clegg, if you well, will, let me, just, let me bring in another... <laughs> you, it is related to this, so you will have your opportunity. Uh, Jamila Long, who is in banking. Jamila. How are we supposed to compete with the likes of China or America if we're not part of a larger trading group? So how would we compete with the likes of China and America if we're not part of a bigger trading bloc? Neatly, Mr Clegg, it falls to you to go no, first. I, I, I agree with you, Jamila. Look, the, the world is changing dramatically. You know this, Jamila, from your, from your experience in, in, in finance. We all know this. It's not the 1950s. We can't turn the clock back. We've got these new powers on the world stage, Brazil, China, India, and we, we get more clout by operating through the world's largest economy. That's what the European Union is, despite its faults, despite the fact that it needs to be reformed. It is the world's <coughs> largest economy. And we get clout by actually representing 500 million people when we measure up to the Chinese and the Americans and others in trade negotiations. This is the fundamental flaw of UKIP's vision. Just imagine what would happen. So we pull out of the European Union. We're no longer part of that largest, the world's largest economy. We no longer have the clout of being part of that economic superpower. And we, as a country of 60 million, power, of 60 million people, are, according to UKIP, be, supposed to be able to cut the same deal with the giants of America and China as we can with the clout of representing 500 million consumers. It simply doesn't add up. We get Five more seconds. clout rather than less by being part of this big European economic superpower. Mr Clegg, thank you. <laughs> Nigel Farage. Well, 
Once again, Nick, you just show you don't, you don't really understand the worlds of commerce and trade. Do you know, when the World Trade Organization meets to discuss global trade, the British representatives are shown the door and asked to leave. Yeah. The, the world's sixth largest trading nation, the world's eighth largest manufacturing nation, yeah. is not allowed to be present in the room. It's not true. Because we're members of a European Union, so we have to be represented by a Dutch bureaucrat whose name no one knows and who nobody can vote for. A, a quite extraordinary state of affairs. We are banned, forbidden, from making our own trade deals, you know, with countries like India or Canada or Australia or New Zealand. People who would, at the drop of a hat, sign trade deals with us, we are prevented from doing so. And, and you know, the reason is, people like Nick don't think Britain's good enough. We're just not good enough. We must give away control of all of these things to somebody else who'll do it for us. We're too small to survive. Iceland has 320,000 people. And in March last year, they signed a free trade agreement with China. If it's good enough for Iceland to do it, I'm damn certain the British, with 64 million, could do even better. <laughs> Mr Farage, you... Can I respond to that? In a sentence, if can I, you can would, I, can I respond to that? Because unlike uh, Nigel Farage, I actually, before I went into politics, was involved in these trade negotiations. It is simply not true what you've just heard. Of course it is right that the European Union should measure up as a block with a clout of 500 million consumers when you negotiate with the Chinese and the Americans and the Russians, as I did in a previous job. By the way, I keep hearing what Nigel Farage's part. He and I were actually elected as Euro MPs right. on the same day in 2009. I left the European Parliament after five years. He still remains the Euro politician. But I think it is important that we remember that we gain clout by being part of the world's largest economic superpower. And the idea that we would first have to, if we did what UKIP said, first have to renegotiate with 27 other countries in the rest of Europe, and then negotiate with the 50 countries through which we have trade agreements because of our membership of the European Union. So that's 77 right. countries that a future government would have to renegotiate trade agreements with just to get some of the trade access let's, back that we've lost. Get, I tell you, a government in the future would do nothing for no. the next 20 years. Let's no, not, a, not unless we get a government that believes in Britain, believes in the British people and says we can make our own arrangements all over the world that suit us and we don't have to do it. I believe, in, I believe in jobs in this country. European to suggest countries. that believing that's in jobs in this country... We've got to have a global future for Britain, not one tied, shackled inside a European Union that is showing itself to be out of date and failing in every measure. Mr Farage, I wonder, I wonder if I can show you some literature that's going to be sent out as part of your campaign for the forthcoming European election. The EU costs the UK £55 million a day, and this is the leaflet that I will be going out later. Where do you get that figure yeah. from? Well, that is just, I mean, I mean, to be fair, Nick, that is just our contribution. I mean, that is the beginning of you the cost. You don't say that here. That is the beginning. No. If, if you really add it all up, if you really add it all up, the true cost of membership of the European Union is many, many times that. No. Uh, because what, we've, what, what we found... What about the rebates? What we found... Programs, well, if, you know, if, you, if I give you £20, yes. you know, and you give me £10 back, I'm not better off, am I? So we give them gross £55 million a day. Yes, they give us money back, but they only give us money back to be spent on ways that they choose not the ways that we choose. But the, but the true cost is the leading, is it not, Mr Farage? Uh, no, it is absolutely factual. That is our contribution. Of course, it's as I said at the start, As I said at the start of this programme, our membership fee of the club is £55 million pounds a day. But, but, but again, our total I have to put cost, it to you, you but exclude our, rebates, you but, exclude... Well, fun, well, I have to put it for a I've third excluded, time. I've excluded uh, the loss of our fishing. I've excluded the massive cost, the, 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 the environmental cost... Uh, frankly, right. of building wind turbines and damaging the manufacturing industry. By this may, 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 no, that, is, that figure is a very, very low figure. The true cost of EU membership is okay. many times that. Okay. Okay. May, may, I make, may I make two, two observations? Uh, just like this leaflet saying that 29 million Romani Romanians and Bulgarians are going to turn up on your doorstep. Didn't and there aren't that. even you know 29 million you know Romanians and Bulgarians that. there. This is, a, this is once true. again a claim that simply is not true. If you actually count the rebate, if you actually count what British farmers, for instance, receive in the Common Agricultural Policy, it's less than half that figure. And if you then consider how we do, how we benefit from the jobs, from the trade that we get from being part of the, the world's largest economy, actually, reliable estimates show that it's worth about 3,000, up to 3,300 pounds per household. But the question 
for Nigel Farage is, if he cares so much about British money, why is it when this government negotiated a cut, which he said was not possible, a cut in the EU budget, saving 30, million, 30 <coughs> billion uh, British, uh, pounds, why was it that the UK Independence Party MEPs didn't even bother to vote for it? So if you actually have yeah. a place in Europe where you can bat for Britain, why is it that UK MEPs well, again let's, and let's again say, and again well, don't stand up for Britain? That's the bit I let, simply don't understand. Isn't, 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 isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that you're... The Prime Minister, your partner, comes back from Brussels and says, I've struck a great deal. It's a victory for Britain. And I hope that British MEPs will support this. This victory for Britain meant that whilst the EU's overall budget didn't increase as much as expected, Britain's contributions would rise. If that's a victory in Europe, I'd hate to see what a defeat looks like. <laughs> Let's, move. Let's move to another question. Uh, Clive Hyman. Mr. Hyman, you're a property investment consultant. Mr. Hyman. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> concerns control of our own borders. What do you say to the future victims of criminals whom we cannot deport because of our involvement with Europe, with the EU, and the Human Rights Act? All right. What would you say to future victims of crime who we might not be able to deport because of the Human Rights Act? It falls to you for the opening minute, Nigel Farage. Well, if I was a member of the Liberal Democrat, Labour or, or Conservative parties uh, that had allowed this legislation uh, to come on to the British statute book, then what I ought to be doing is I ought to be saying I am very sorry. Because the one thing, there are lots of things, by the way, we can learn from Europe. You know, and we are learning some of them. The food's getting better here and that's great. But one thing, one thing, well, it's true. I mean, one thing that we cannot learn from the political union centred in Brussels is about a criminal justice system and the concepts of liberty and freedom. Because, you know, since Magna Carta and the evolution and development of common law, we have had the fairest and best judicial system in the world. And I'm afraid that what the Human Rights Act has done is it's thrown all of this up in the air and we finish up with a ridiculous situation where we can't deport an Italian mafia boss back to Italy because under his human rights, the jails there aren't up to an acceptable standard. It's time we got back to the principle of liberty and freedom and forgot about European human rights. Thank you, Mr. Barat. <laughs> Nick Clegg. Clive, Clive, do you, Clive, do you remember the, the man, Hussein Osman, who wore a backpack with a bomb in it, went to Shepherd's Bush tube station, he wanted to blow up lots of people. He, the, thankfully, the backpack didn't go off, the bomb didn't go off, he fled to Italy. He was brought back here and he now is in jail for 40 years. Do you remember, uh, do you remember that teacher, uh, Jeremy Forrest, a couple of years ago, who basically took that young girl <coughs> to France? Do you remember? And he was brought back within days uh, and he's now facing, he's now in jail for five and a half years. I just mentioned those two examples because I thought you might remember them. There are actually hundreds of other examples. They were all brought back to face British justice and they're now in British prisons because we have European Union rules, which we wouldn't have if we did what Nigel Farage and UKIP wanted. The European Arrest Warrant, which allows us to take murderers, rapists, paedophiles and other people who want to do us harm and bring them back here to face British justice. If we pulled out of that, which is what Nigel Farage wants, we wouldn't have got Hussein Osman back, he wouldn't be in prison now, and neither would Jeremy Forrest. Right. Actually, by Five cooperating seconds. with other European countries, since criminal cross, criminals cross borders, we must cross borders too to make right. our streets safe. Mr Clegg, thank you. A, a response to that, two words, Abu Qatada. It took 12 years to get him out of the it country. It has nothing to do with the European Union. We did eventually deport him to join. It's, it's, it's the European Convention of Human Rights, which was actually drafted, by the way, after the last war by British lawyers. It's incorporated into British law. It is not the European Union. European Union member states are signatories to it. But it is simply wrong to claim that somehow our streets would be safer if we robbed... And look, again, don't believe my word for it, or Nigel Farage's. The most senior, one of the most senior police officers in this country, Sir Hugh Ord, the head of the Association of Chief Police Officers, said the European arrest warrant 
has, is, is, in his words, an essential weapon in the fight against organised crime. How on earth is it possible for UKIP to claim it is somehow patriotic to make our streets less safe? Right. Well, I'll How tell on you earth then. is it possible that well, you can I'll claim that somehow we, you're standing up for well, Britain <laughs> if you would not actually right. extradite and bring back right. hundreds we, of people this, to face British Mr. justice? We, this, we, this, we really gets to the heart. this really gets to the heart, doesn't it, of the differences between us. And by the way, I don't agree with Nick. <laughs> we, I, Nick, that would be a shock. That that would be a shock. Nick, we signed, we signed our first extradition treaty in this country in 1174, 850 years ago. We currently have extradition treaties with 92 different countries all over the world. Yes, we have to cooperate on cross-border crime. We do it through extradition treaties, and we do it through organisations like Interpol, which we've been working in since 1923. All right? I, of course, want us to have sensible extradition laws, not just with the EU, but all over the world. The European arrest warrant is totally unnecessary. And can I say that for someone like Andrew Simiou from North London to be dragged off without the production of any prima facie evidence, to be left to rot in a Greek hellhole for over a year without his rights of habeas corpus, I think is an abomination. And is how it, you can call it, yourself a this liberal, is this is how you can call yourself this a liberal, fantasy. and to support the destruction no. of all the great principles of British liberty by signing up to European law, I do not this, know. All right, again, let's, let's, really like let's, let's go, let's, let's just you know, leave the rhetoric aside for a minute and let's stick to the facts. Since just 2009, so just over the last few years, 149 murderers, murderers, have been extradited to or from the United Kingdom because of the European arrest warrant. 120 paedophiles who've done untold damage to, to innocent children have been extradited to and from the United Kingdom because of the European arrest warrant. And the police tell us it is an essential weapon in their job in keeping us safe. I believe the police more than I believe Nigel Farage. Let me give you one more example of one how important it is to... Uh, do you remember Minister. back in 2001 there were, there were those plane spotters, the, uh, the British and Dutch plane spotters? It, I chuckle now, but it wasn't funny then. They got caught up in the Greek legal system. They ended up in Greek jail. They had no idea what was being told to them. They had no idea what charges were being brought against them. They had no legal assistance. The European Union has now passed new rules, new laws, which means that if any of you go on holiday elsewhere in the European Union and you find yourself on the wrong side of the law, you'll get help with interpretation, you'll get legal help, you'll get assistance. Right. Guess what UKIP did? They voted against all of those measures. Another example of the European Union yeah. keeping us yeah. safe and protecting our rights. And if you get Nigel, arrested in Spain... Nigel Farage. If you, if you get arrested in Spain, Nick, you get arrested in Spain for something you haven't done, you may be left up to 18 months in prison without even facing a charge. We have a system of common law in this country. We've had it for 800 years. Why did you vote, against, based, why did you vote based, against measures to help British tourists? It is based on the presumption of innocence before guilt. It is based on habeas corpus and common why, law. Why did, and we why must did you defend, vote against... We the, must defend the principles of liberty, freedom and justice do, do in to, this country. You should, you should, defend, no, hang on, I, you should defend... We should Mr. all Clay, defend uh, the right... I'm a British I citizen. Have, Clay, Why did you Mr. not Clay, vote? I have not voted. Mr. Clay, I am moderating this debate. Thank you. I have not Would you voted. like to respond to a question that was put yeah. twice? I've by been Mr. in the European Parliament now 15 years. They're getting a bit cheesed off of me over there, I've got to tell you. And I have not, I have not voted in 15 years for one single piece of legislation right. that has added to the power base of the European Commission in Brussels. Even and when I it, never, even when I it never, means ever British ever tourists, will. even when it means British tourists will. who get caught up I on the wrong side will. of the law, when on holiday, I believe who need it, translation, they need help, they need right. lawyers, they need Nick, assistance. I believe, Why I is it that UKIP dogma is so strong now, you won't Jill, even help British I'll tourists when you. they're on the wrong Let side me. of the law, I'll on holiday, I'll elsewhere? What, Nick, I'll tell you what the dogma is. The dogma is, I believe the best people to govern Britain are the British people themselves, not the European. Okay, we move, that's move on. I think it's a situation here I don't agree with, Nick. Um, while we're on people's rights, Nigel Farage, a clarification would be useful. Uh -huh. What is your position on same-sex marriage, which comes to eff into effect this Saturday? A, a statement was put out by your press office, which was subsequently withdrawn. Do you support it, yes or no? Uh, not all the while we are signed up to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and where we have the risk that our established church and possibly other faith communities could ultimately, under discrimination laws, be forced to conduct services that they find anathema. If we, if we get rid of the ECHR and it doesn't have the dominant place over our society, we'll look at it again. Nick Clay. 
Of course I support it. I, I, I was the first party leader who came out to support it because I think when two individuals, regardless of their gender, love each other and want to show commitment towards each other, we should recognise that in law. And it, it really... I just, I just find it extraordinary that UKIP's anti-European is so great they won't actually provide loving couples in Britain with the right to marry, as they will be able to under British law from this weekend. And do you know what, for me, it is just unalloyed great news that love and commitment is now going to be recognised in marriage across the whole of the country, regardless of your gender. I think it's a wonderful step forward. All right. We move on. We move on to Christopher King. We move on to Christopher King, who is an IT consultant. Mr King. Hello. Oh, why does Great Britain always adhere so strictly to EU laws when other countries seem to cherry-pick which laws they're going to comply with? Mr King, thank you. A nice booming voice as well. Nick Clegg, it falls to you first. Your minute. Uh, it, actually, we're roughly middle of the pack. There are some uh, other European countries, Christopher, that are better at kind of, you know, abiding by the rules. There are some that are, are worse. Uh, look, you need, don't you, in a, in a big marketplace like this, where I don't know what your business is, Christopher, but lots of people, as you know, are in businesses in this country where they export to the rest of the European Union. You need some basic rules. It, it, it actually helps businesses not to have 28 different rules when you are selling your products to different parts of the European Union. That's why you need to have those rules, to make sure that selling to 500 million consumers on our European doorstep in this, in this largest economy in the world is done in a way where people don't fiddle the rules. That's why you have a court. That's why you have rules. That's why they, generally speaking, should, of course, be uh, obeyed. And it's exactly the same, of course, in Britain too. And look, you'll hear from Nigel Farage say, oh, 75% of our laws. No. Actually, the House of Commons has shown that roughly 7%, 7% of all new laws are related to the European Union. But they do need to Five be there, that 7%, in order to make sure that you, or indeed anybody else who's exporting into the rest of the European Union can do so without fear that the Thank rules you. are somehow going to work against you. Thank you, Mr Clegg. Nigel Farage. Oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> You've used some seconds up. I'd hurry 7%. up if I were you. 7%. What are you on about? We had one of your friends from Brussels, Commissioner Vivian Reding, in London the other week saying we must all sign up to the United States of Europe and we must recognise the importance of Brussels because, after all, it makes 70% of our laws. Even Gordon Brown said over half our laws are made in Brussels in Germany. The former president conducted a review and concluded that 84% of their federal laws were conducted in Brussels and you put this pretense out to people, many in this room are running businesses, who know that all the regulations that affect their business are made in Brussels. We obey the, we obey the rules, sir because we believe in the Anglo-Saxon rule of law. It's our culture. Actually, most of the rest of Northern Europe obey the rules too, but in the South, they have a completely different attitude, which just goes to show what a tragedy it is that the Mediterranean was signed up to Nick's beloved Euro and that tens of millions of people have now been forced into poverty. I want a Europe where we trade together, cooperate together, but a Europe of sovereign free states, not a political union based in Brussels, run by unelected bureaucrats. <laughs> Nigel. Nigel Farage, where do, you, where do you get the 75% of laws figure from? Well, that's the estimate that we've made, and we've asked people, okay, but where, we've asked people to count it. I think it's fair well, to say, say, where do you get it from? If I went with the German figure, I'd have gone higher. Okay, yes. can I, the can German I, can figure I suggest, is... The German figure is 84%. Comes from? The German Vivian would Reading say says he was misquoted. I have to say uh, that. Our Go ahead, Mr Farage. I mean, I mean, whichever way it is, Nick, whichever way it is, the one thing I thought everybody was agreed on was that one of the reasons we're having this debate, and that Nick challenged me to this debate, is that the European question, whether you agree with it or not, is of fundamental importance. And I've, I've, I've not met anybody serious who said that less than half of our laws were now made in Brussels. Well, can, I, can I tell you someone who is serious? <laughs> it's the House of Commons Library. And I suspect the House of uh, Commons Library is going to know better than Nigel Farage or indeed the German president or anybody else how many laws in the House of Commons, which is where laws are transposed, transposed onto the statute book, how many of them are generated here in Britain, how many of them are generated in the European Union? Their estimate is 7%, not 75%. What we've heard this evening on jobs, on immigration, on investment, and now on EU laws, again and again and again, are the wrong facts. Now, let's right. disagree, fine, but I really do think that uh, we owe it to you, we owe it to everybody, to make sure that these debates on a very important issue is at least based on facts. And the House of Commons Library has been unambiguous, has said that it is 7%, not 75%. All right. And I believe them. M Mr Clegg, we, we must move on. This is the LBC leaders' debate. Nick Clegg versus Nigel Farage on the European Union. You're listening on LBC, 
watching on lbc.co.uk, you can take part in the reaction using hashtag LBC debate. To another email question from LBC listener Beth Porter. You talk about trust. My husband's a fireman. You want me to trust you over Europe. How can I believe your plausibility and integrity when, Nigel Farage, you've put your wife on your payroll, Nick Clegg, you lied about tuition fees? It falls to Nick Clegg to go first. Well, I, I, of course I accept that um, trust is a, is a rare commodity in politics these days. It's one of the reasons why, uh, in, in the earlier discussion we had about the referendum, it's now been taken out of the hands of politicians like Nigel Farage and myself. It's now in law that there is this guarantee that there should be a referendum. But at the end of the day, it's not really what this politician or that politician says or this political party or that political party is. Do you believe in your gut that in this world where there are so many things that we can't, we simply can't do on our own anymore. We can't go after criminals who cross borders without working with others. We can't deal with climate change without working with others. And, we, and, it, and it makes sense for us to have the clout of being in right. the world's largest economy. Doesn't it make sense to keep those jobs, right. to retain that clout, we've, and to catch those criminals we've moved a rather than put away, all of that at risk? We've moved a little way perhaps from individual matters, Mr. Clegg, but I note your answer. Thank you. There's also speaking to your, yeah. uh, what did you say, integrity, I think, and plausibility. You're paying your wife. Well, you know, I do actually lead a group in the European Parliament and a national political party yeah, you said in this that you country. Would, you I, I, I never publicly said I wouldn't, no. And I very, much doubt, staff I very much doubt that anybody else in British politics has worked the hours and had so little fun as me over the course of the last I'm few years. I'm very sorry to hear that. I, I don't mean, see how no, paying your wife makes, one day. makes up it for that. Well, because actually, Nick, when you get home at midnight, if you're lucky, uh, you need someone there to actually say, I've done this, I've done that, here are the documents for tomorrow, and, and, and without having unpaid assistance from my wife for seven years, and paid in a very modest way for five years, I couldn't have done it. Do you enjoy what you do? Yes, I do, because I think that, uh, I mean, I was in business for 20 years, I got into politics because I felt that the career political class in Westminster had given away my birthright, our ability to govern our own country, and I'm on a mission to get that back, and I think those messages are getting through, so yes, I love it. Nick Clegg, we talked a little bit about the promise you made as a younger man back in 2008, we've talked about tuition fees, this is a hurdle you have to cross, isn't it? No, look, I totally accept that when you're dealing with something as important as whether we stay in or out of the European Union, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be just up to you know, people to, to, to hear what politicians have to say. People should be given access to the facts, because I think so many of the facts have been distorted for so long. I think many people feel that you know, they just hear lots of polemic, lots of rhetoric. They want to know what the facts are. They want to know what the facts are about the number of jobs right. that are at stake, how we catch criminals, how we protect ourselves from climate change. And I just think, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to whether you believe that the world has changed such that you can actually do more by working with other countries or whether you achieve more, and I don't think we could, by simply becoming isolated and turning our back okay. on the rest of the what world. What I want to do, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you for about 45-second answers, and I'm going to have to be quite brief on this. This is the final LBC listener email from Polina Poloniva. Why are countries such as Ukraine so keen to develop closer ties with the EU while in the UK there is a debate about doing the opposite? We have to be fairly brutal on time. I'll come to you first, Mr Clegg. I think Paulina makes a very important point. I, I, you know, it was very moving to see those people demonstrating for their freedom, demonstrating for their rights, some of them dying for it, in Kiev. And what we've seen in the European Union, despite its flaws, yes, it needs to be reformed, is you've seen a number of countries that were under the communist yoke in Central and Eastern Europe becoming democracies because they've become part of the family of nations within the European Union. You've seen a number of dictatorships in the south of Europe that have become part of the European Union and have become democracies, having been, fasc having been be fascist dictatorships. Seconds, and that, I think, is one of the things we can be proud of because it was the British British governments that, that pioneered the enlargement of the European Union so we'd have right. more peace, more democracy and more rule of law right. in our European right. neck of the Mr. woods. Mr Clegg, thank you for being so brief. You must respond as well, Nigel. Yeah, we hang our heads in shame. Uh, the British government has actually G'd up the European Union uh, to pursue effectively an imperialist, expansionist, and even Mr Barroso, the Commission President, uh, once himself said, you know, that we are building an empire. We've given a false series of hopes to a group of people in the Western Ukraine. Uh, so G'd up were they. Uh, that they actually toppled their own elected leader. Uh, that provoked Mr Putin. And I think the European Union, uh, frankly, does have blood on its hands in the Ukraine. And I don't want a European army, navy, air force, or a European foreign policy. It has not been a thing for good in the Ukraine. We come to our closing statements. Again, it falls to Nick Clegg to go first. It has to be a tight minute, Deputy Prime Minister. Please start. You know what's at stake here? British jobs, uh, safety, 
our economic recovery, our place in the world. So don't be fooled, because quitting Europe would put all of that at risk, all of it. And it would also turn us into a country that we don't want to be, closed and narrow, isolated. I want us to be Great Britain, not Little England. And if you feel the same, then now is the time to make your voice heard, because Labour and the Conservatives are going to do nothing, nothing, to stop us heading towards the exit. So if you believe, as I do, even if you haven't voted for the Liberal Democrats before, but if you believe that we're better off in, then at least on this occasion, on May the 22nd, in the European elections, I hope you will give us your support. Thank Mr. You. Clegg, thank you. A minute for you. Thank you. <laughs> Nigel Farage. Uh, Nick Clegg did not answer the question that I repeatedly asked him tonight. Uh, namely, is it true that we have a total open door to 485 million people from Europe, many of them from poor countries? He wouldn't answer that. The answer is yes, we have a total open door. And that is the issue, I think, that has woken people up, that by being a member of the European Union, we've lost the ability to govern our country and to control our borders. Now, you know, Nick represents a tired status quo defending a model that maybe 40 years ago looked like a good idea, but leaves us totally unfit to compete in a 21st century global economy. Trade with Europe, cooperation with Europe, friendship with Europe, but I'm British, I believe the best people to govern Britain are the British people themselves, and I believe that by divorcing ourselves from this failed project, not only will we free Britain, will provide a good example for much of the rest of Europe too. I think the majority of people are now on our side. They believe we must get our country back. We're going to fight damned hard in the next few weeks and put that choice on the ballot paper for okay. you on May the 22nd. Nigel Farage, thank you for that. And that is all we have time for, I'm sorry. Hopefully you might now know whether you're in you're out, or perhaps just a little shaken all about. <laughs> so who won? The verdict follows immediately on LBC with continuous coverage from Ian Dale in the spin room. And remember, Nick Clegg is with me tomorrow morning at nine on the LBC breakfast show for Cool Clegg. Nigel Farage joins me the day after on Friday. Many thanks to you for listening and watching, to our studio audience and questioners, and of course to Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage for taking part in this leaders' debate. Good night. Thank you, Michael.